Let's open our Bibles to the book of Job, chapter number 1. Job, chapter number 1. We've been talking about running on empty and almost had a good story to tell you this week. My wife almost ran out of gas and uh, got very close taking the kids to school one day this week and uh, the Lord spared her from that embarrassment. That would have been awesome. I was waiting for it, but uh, she made it to a gas station. Yeah, she made it, but uh, as I mentioned, I, I've not run out of gas yet. I won't say it won't ever happen because who knows what's going to happen in life. But I have had some times where my car is broken down in the middle of nowhere. And that's usually where a car breaks down. It's, it's always in the middle of nowhere. It's never, for me anyway, it's never break down right in front of the auto repair shop. That just does not happen. And uh, on a number of occasions, we've had uh, the unfortunate privilege of being broken down in the middle of nowhere. And a, a couple of times, it happened uh, when we first got married, my wife and I, and we were living down in Pensacola and uh, Foley, Alabama area, and we would only come home once a year for two weeks, and, uh, which was an, a very important thing for my wife. Um, I didn't mind staying down there by the beach, and if family wants to come see me for Christmas and we all go to the beach together and open presents on the beach, that would be fine with me. Uh, but getting home for Christmas and seeing our family was super important. Christmas is a big deal to my wife. And uh, so we were on our way home, and uh, we got maybe just two or three hours down the road, and our car broke down. And uh, we're out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, so I leave my wife and uh, Catherine in the car, and I'm going to walk somewhere to go find help. Uh, didn't really know where I was going to find it, so I just kind of hit the road and started walking and uh, walked up to a church that was on the highway and nobody was there. So I kept on walking and all of a sudden this truck pulls up alongside of me and says, you know, you need a ride somewhere. And I said, yeah, my, my car broke down back there. I need to, you know, get somewhere where I can call for some help, a tow truck or something. And uh, so he says, hop in. And so I get in and I shut the door and he starts driving. And I uh, didn't notice so much when I opened the door, but when I got in, you know, there's that uh, unmistakable aroma of alcohol. And uh, then I look and I see a gun on the seat, like a handgun. And I'm like, oh, man, this is not going to be good. Uh, I've heard about stories like this, the backwoods of Alabama somewhere, and uh, you're never heard from again. I'm like, they're going to find pieces of me all over the place or something, but... And so I was, a little, I was a little nervous, and so I have my hand, like, on the door, ready to jump out if need be, and uh, he, he gives me the number so we can call a tow truck, and it uh, takes me around and uh, drops me off by my car, thank goodness. He's like, you want me to wait around? I'm like, no, we're good. We got it. Thanks. Thanks for the ride, but what a, you know, what a fearful time that is. You know, and a lot of times in life, we're going along, we've got certain plans, certain ideas, things are going well, and all of a sudden, we're on empty. This car won't go anymore. We've broken down, we're out of gas, nothing left to give, trying to figure out what it is we're supposed to do. And here in Job chapter number one, we read about this man of Job who things are going very well. It tells us that he was a... Verse number one, he was a perfect and upright man and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Tells us a little bit about his family. He has seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. And verse number 10 tells us that the reason that was so was because the Lord had blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. So God blessed him. Now the Bible tells us God blesses each and every one of us. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. So every good thing that we have in our lives comes from God. And God had blessed Job immensely. He had such a, a wonderful family. Had wealth, and with that wealth during this time period came power, came authority, he is the greatest man in the East, it tells us. 
So things are running along very well for Job. Coasting along very smoothly. And yet there comes a point where all of a sudden the bottom falls out and he's on empty. And the question is, because we're all going to get to that place if we're not there already. You will get to the place where you're on empty. Whether emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially, it will happen in your life and most likely it will happen over and over and over again. And so our response during these times is key for how we're going to move forward and what God is going to do in our lives. Job had a right response. It's a response I wish that I could say that I've always had when I've run out empty. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us. Lord, as we spend some time looking into your word and looking at the life of Job, I pray for those who are here, those who may be watching online, God, that you would meet them where they are. So many struggles and problems. Lord, so many who are running on empty with nothing left to give. Lord, I pray that during these times that you would teach us and show us and empower us with what you want us to do and how you want us to live. Lord, may we have that right response that we ought to have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we we see about the wealth and the power and the authority and how things are going so well for Job. And uh, verse number 6 kind of explains some things that are going on. It says, now there was a day when the sons of God, now that phrase sons of God in the Old Testament refers to angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And so here the Lord is having this conversation with Satan. And uh, Satan talks about going up and down, and we know that he is like a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he may devour. And uh, God says, hey, have have you thought about Job for a minute? I mean, he's somebody who is spiritually mature. Once again, the idea of the word perfect there doesn't mean he's sinless, because there was only one sinless man, and he died to pay the price for our sin. Uh, But he's mature in the faith. He's got a relationship that has moved past the basics and has developed into a mature relationship. He's upright. He fears God and hates evil. I mean, can you imagine for a moment what the Lord would say about you? What would he say about me? We could spend a long time just talking about that for a while. But Job lived in such a way that God put him out there as an example of somebody who will live right and do right no matter the circumstances, no matter what's going on. He's going to live right and do right. And so God says, you know, what about Job? Job's a man who fears God, hates evil. And uh, verse number 9, Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught or nothing? Does he fear God for nothing? Hast not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. And so he says, you know, he's he's not serving you for nothing. I mean, you have put your hand of protection around him. You have blessed him immensely. He's the greatest man in the whole land. So of course he's going to fear you. Of course he's going to love you and serve you. He says in verse 11, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And so God says, all right, you can put your hand forth on all that he hath. And uh, so that's exactly what Satan does. There was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. 
And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And so he gets this bad news about his oxen, about his asses, that they've been slaughtered. And during this time, cattle and livestock were the means of wealth. And so here he's, you know, the stock market has crashed for him. While he was yet speaking, so one servant is giving him this bad news. There came another also and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So he's getting bad news from this individual. Then this other servant comes up and says, Fire fell down from heaven, killed the sheep, killed all the servants. I'm the only one left alive. And while someone's giving him that bad news, there came another one in verse number 17. He says, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. More bad news. Chaldeans have come in. They've taken away the camels. They've killed the servants that were taking care of them. While he was yet speaking, they came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground. And so here we have this time where things are going along very smoothly for Job. Then this servant comes, says, listen, your ox and your asses, they've been destroyed. While he's speaking, another servant comes up, says, the sheep are gone. They've been taken away. Your servants have been killed. While he's speaking, another one comes up and says, they've taken away your camels, killed your servants. While he's speaking, another one comes and says, a storm hit the house, killed your sons and your daughters. I've had days like that where it seems like every person I meet has some sort of bad news to tell me. If I see another person today, I'm going to run in the opposite direction because there's so much bad news sometimes. And uh, we can't even begin to imagine what's going on in these circumstances and how much he lost in such a little bit of time. All we have to do is look back just a couple of years ago when the stock market did crash. And these wealthy and powerful people that had so much invested lost everything in one day. And that the stories come out as people kill themselves because they have nothing left. They've run on empty. And here Job is going along and all of a sudden something punctures the tank. The fuel is gone. I've lost absolutely everything all in a matter of moments. All his wealth is gone. Children gone. And as we continue reading here, notice his response. We kind of stopped at the last two words in verse number 20. He, he rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and he has a little different response than I think I would have. I'm going to be honest with you. If I lost everything, including my children, in one day, I don't know that I would fall on the ground and worship. That's his response. I can't imagine the faith and the relationship that he had. I pray that would be my response, but I don't know that it would be. I think I would have a difficult time. And each of us have been to a place where we've lost different things, whether it's finances or a house or a car or someone that we hold dear, a loved one. Every single one of us has been to that place. We know the pain and the sorrow. And here he loses all ten of his children in a matter of moments. After you hear that last guy, none of the, the reports of the other men even matter. At that point, he lost all 10 of his children at once. And we can kind of understand a little bit the sorrow. Some of you have lost children. And you understand the pain and the sorrow that comes from that. We've all lost somebody who is near and dear to our heart. It's a fact in a matter of life. 
But one of the things I want us to see through these circumstances is that God is absolutely in control at all times. That nothing happens to you and nothing happens to me unless God allows it to happen or he does it himself. And so I know whatever is happening in my life is not by accident. That it didn't just happen and God is unaware of what's going on. Now I have that feeling sometimes. There have been times in my life where I was not like Job and I fell out and worshipped and I fell out and thanked God. There were times where certain things happened in my life and I'm, I'm questioning with God and I'm struggling. Lord, do you see and understand what I'm facing and what I'm going through. I've been on empty. I know what empty feels like. And I know a lot of times I haven't had the right response. But to know and understand that what I'm facing, I'm facing because God allowed it. God allowed these things to happen to Job. He gave Satan some requirements. He says, you can go so far, you can touch all he has, but... Leave Job alone. And so he takes away his wealth. His children die. But God is still in control. And that's a lot easier for me to say than it is to live out my life. But it's information that is true from Scripture. That for many of you, I know what's brought you to empty. I know your struggles. For many of you, I don't know. But I do know and understand that no matter what we face, God is well aware. God is in control of those circumstances. There are times that it doesn't feel like He is. But to know the truth of Scripture, that He is the one that is in control, and Job understands that, and Job has the right response. Look what he says in verse number 21. He fell to the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now I wish I could always say that I said that during difficult times. But he knows and understands that God is the one who is in control. That it was God who gave him all these things. And God has the right to take it away. And sometimes we forget that. We in America have this entitlement mentality that we deserve this or that, that we ought to be treated this way or that way. And we almost have the idea, we never say it to God. But with our attitudes and with our lives sometimes, we act like God owes us certain things and certain standards of living and this and that. God owes us nothing. I was having a conversation uh, with a pastor friend of mine just uh, on Friday. And we were having some discussion about some things in Scripture. And uh, one of the things that we were talking about and, and referencing was the fact that God does not owe it to anyone to even offer the gift of salvation. God does not owe me that opportunity. All of us deserve to suffer and pay for our own sins. And so it doesn't matter if it's someone here. It doesn't matter if it's someone to the ends of the earth. God owes no man anything. But God in his grace and his mercy bestows good things to us. He gives us the opportunity of salvation. He gives us clothes to wear. He gives us houses and cars and kids And everything that we have has been given to us by God out of his goodness and grace, not because I deserve it. And we forget that sometimes. We need to understand everything that we have has been given to us by Almighty God, that he is in control. The kids that I have, I had a good time with my daughters last night. had a great time. The kids I have... They're not mine. They belong to Almighty God. God gave them to me. And I know this is a dangerous thing to say. But they're His. And if God chooses, He can take them away. 
because God is in control. I remember when my third daughter was born, uh, all excited, and, uh, you know, by the third one, you think you got it all figured out, especially when things have gone very smoothly. The first one, you're you're nervous as can be, and and everything, I I mean, if I didn't take that prenatal class or whatever it was, I I would have swear that that my wife was going to die and everybody in the room was going to die. It was quite an eye-opener, and, uh, but, at, you know, the second one, things began to look kind of normal, and by the third one, you kind of know what to expect, and uh, for all three of my kids, you know, things have gone very smoothly for the pregnancy, and uh, even my wife would say that, and uh, we go in, and, and time to have Abigail, who means father's joy, and uh, things are progressing along, and we're getting to 10 centimeters where it's about time to go, and uh, the doctor comes in and does a last-minute check, and, you know, I know some of you have heard this story before, but the doctor says, get me an ultrasound machine now. And those are words I had not heard before. They're not normal words at this point in the process. And so my wife and I are a little, you know, a little nervous, want to try to know what's going on. And of course, they don't tell you anything. They're, all they're concerned about is the child and about the mother's safety. And, and uh, what had happened is my wife had extra fluid in her sack. And with those last couple of contractions getting ready to go, she, the baby turned breech. And uh, so they, they rushed my wife out of the room and uh, left me all alone. And just wondering if my wife is going to be okay. And uh, of course she, she was. And, but I remember when Abigail was born, like I wasn't even concerned with Abigail. I, I was just concerned, is my, is my wife okay? And uh, you can see it in the pictures of me holding the baby. My face is still white, absolutely just white. But... You know, I remember being in that room alone and just talking to the Lord and saying, Lord, if, if you're all I have, that's enough for me. Yeah. Good. And we need to get to that place where we understand that everything that I have has been given to me by God. It belongs to him, and so he is free to do with it what he wants to do. Whether it's the possessions that we have, whether it's the family. Here, Job knew and understood God was in control and that God was the one who gave him these things. And so if God gave them, then he can take them away. And he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Doesn't end there, though. Chapter 2 begins, again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, and this is what's amazing to me, that here the second time he says, Have you considered my servant Job? And notice what he says is exactly the same as what he said before. Even through the difficulty of losing all his wealth, even through losing his ten children, the testimony of Job remains the same. He says, there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And notice this phrase, and I've underlined it in my Bible, and still he holdeth fast his integrity. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And even through the hardship, and even through running on empty and losing everything, he held fast to his integrity. I haven't always done that. I haven't always had the right response. Job has the proper response. And without the help from God Almighty, we're not going to have the right response. 
He holds fast his integrity. Verse 4, Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan from forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his feet and to his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. And so once again, God says, hey, have you considered my servant Job? He fears God. He hates evil. He holds fast even through all this stuff that you had me put him through for no cause. He holds fast his integrity. Of course, Satan says, yeah, well, that's all fine. People will trade everything they have for their, their life. So God says, all right, you can do whatever you want to him. You've got to spare his life. And so if Satan's going to do something, he's going to do the most horrible thing that he can possibly do. And so he puts these painful sores from the sole of his foot, the bottom of his foot to the top of his head. Covers him in these painful sores and he sits there and he scrapes them to try to get that relief from that. His health even. For some of you, that's what's brought you to empty. It's fighting this battle against health. Certain struggles and certain things that come up out of nowhere. Like what's happened with Randy's brother. Continue to pray for him. He touches his health. He's got these painful sores. Every movement, everything that happens in his life is nothing but pain and agony. And it must have been horrible to watch. Verse number 9 tells us, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. And I don't judge her. Because watching someone you love go through pain and difficulty is one of the hardest things to do. To watch them suffer and watch them go through a hard time. And here she watches her husband go through this absolute agony and pain. But Job still has that right response. Whether it's wealth that's brought him to empty, whether it's his family, whether it's health that has brought him to empty, he understood that God was in absolute control. And he says unto her in verse number 10, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. And so he he has the proper response. God gives us good things. God blesses us. He said, if I am willing to enjoy that, I should be willing to endure the difficult times. Should be willing to endure the hardships. It's not much faith if it's just faith during the good times. It's not really praise if we're just praising Him when things are going our way. When we're healthy and wealthy and wise, as the saying goes. No, God is in absolute control. He's free to do whatever He wants to do. If God wants to bless me, then fantastic. If God wants to send me through hardship, then He knows what's best for me. And Job continually had that thought process. Turn over to to Job chapter 23. And it's a verse that I have put to memory, and I would encourage you to as well. And here, Job is, he's having some hard times. These things are beginning to weigh down upon him. His so-called friends were questioning his integrity and everything else about him. And so it's not that Job never had doubts. 
It's not that he ever really struggled and wrestled with what is going on. Let's begin looking, reading in verse number 2. Job is saying, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him, so should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. Backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. And so he says, man, I, I'm, I, I'd love to know where God is right now. And I've been there where it feels like everywhere I look and everywhere I turn, I just can't see him and I can't feel him. But even in those times where Job felt like he was all alone, he says in verse 10, but he knoweth the way that I take when he hath tried me. I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He says, I may not be able to feel him. I may not be able to see and, and, and put my hands around him. But he knows what I'm going through. And he knows what he's doing. And when he tried me, last night we talked about Elijah going through the furnace. When he has tried me, and that's what running on empty is all about. It's a time of trying. It's a time where God is testing us and shaping us and molding us. And he says, when he's brought me through this time of difficulty, I shall come forth as gold. That God knows what he's doing. He knows the reason why he's sending you through this difficult time. We may never know. Some people say, well, when we get to heaven, we'll figure it out. Well, we may never know. God does not owe me an explanation. But I know and understand that he has a plan for my life. And that he has a purpose for whatever it is that I'm facing. And so, yes, I'm running on empty, and it is difficult. But when God sees me through this time, and the way he might see me through is death. Some of you have health issues that you will probably deal with till the day that you die. When he's tried me, when he brings me through this, I'm going to come forth as gold. He's working on something beautiful. But it takes some difficulty to get there. It takes some cutting. It takes some hammering and some shaping and some molding. And those are painful process to go through. But when it's complete, he's going to make something good out of my life. Maybe you're here this morning and you're, you're on empty. You're facing the difficulty, financial, family issues, health problems. I want you to know and understand that although I may not have the answer for what you're going through, and I may not know the reason why, and I, I don't ever try to pretend like I know what people are going through and why. But I do know that God knows and understands. And if we'll continue to put our faith and trust in him, continue to, to look to him during these difficult times, then he's going to make something beautiful out of that. Now I think of those difficult times that I have faced so far in my life, and I would not take them away for anything in the world. Because it was through those hardships that my faith was increased. It was through those hardships that I saw God work and move, and I would not trade that for anything in the world. Yes, it's hard while we're there. But we need to continue to look to him, knowing the plan is for you and I to come forth as gold.